Melissa Broder is the author of the novels Milk Fed and The Pisces, an essay collection titled So Sad Today and four collections of poetry. Her poems have appeared in a multitude of publications and she has also written for the New York Times, Vogue Italia and New York Magazine's The Cut. She is also the recipient of a Pushcart Prize. She joins us with her new novel, Death Valley. Hilary Leichter's novel, Temporary, was long listed for the Penn Hemingway Award and the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Prize. A creative writing professor at Columbia University, she joins us with a new novel, Terrace Story, based on a short story of the same name that won a National Magazine Award. Please first welcome Hilary Leichter to the Free Library stage. Hey, Philadelphia, what's up? Hi. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am not from Philadelphia, but I went to school right outside the city at a little college called Haverford. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that. Some of you, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had so much fun there. Uh, I learned so much. I never got laid. And so I really wanted to read <laughs> I'm going to read two little things tonight, and uh, I wanted to start by reading a section from Tara's story that I haven't read before about college um, in honor of being back in Philadelphia. Freshman year, everyone on top of everyone, no space, all the people on Stephanie's Hall brushing their teeth in unison, buying posters with the discernment of gallerists, tumbling through the stairwells in a joyful stampede. The pile of the dormitory carpet, tight and thick with gossip from long ago nights. Everything startling, immediate, incredible, the smells, disinfectant, cheap cologne, body butter, hair cream, stale beer, feet. The academic buildings, large and brilliant with light, or underground, no windows, a basement lab for a popular course, deep in the recesses of the hill, broken chairs and seminar tables and lecture halls filled with haphazard benches and beams. Stephanie could learn everything wrong, and these classrooms would still make her feel close to being right. The nearness of knowledge, the earnestness of the pursuit, all overlapping. Knowing was not the same as wanting to know, but in college, maybe it was. Stephanie's sweet mate, Doris, always awake. Have you finished that paper? People asked her. I'm possessed, Doris would say. Simply possessed, she'd say, sticking pencils in her hairdo. People in college said shit like this all the time. I'm possessed and on a mission, Doris said at three o'clock in the morning. Early morning, no one awake but Doris and Stephanie. A lawnmower growling in the distance, the starlings that lived in the trees on the quad rejoicing, the booming horn of Stephanie's dreams driving her into daylight, into the shock of cold air through the window, a current cooling the sweat on her sheets. Will, Stephanie's very first friend, he had a mind for politics and philosophy and pretty much all the subjects framed posters of French films from the 60s around his desk, a collection of music both corny and erudite, his furrowed brow crinkling towards some distant inner city of knowledge, a guitar in the corner of his room, gathering dust, aptitude like an armor. I took a class on that, Will would say, in response to most things. <sighs> he thought he knew everything, it was beautiful. Even Stephanie, who knew very little, knew that knowing a little was all anyone could hope for, and yet she could not resist the way he seemed to know a lot. His arrogance, every grammatical correction pressing on the words she would have used to describe her heart. Valedictorian from the Midwest, a kind of charm to which she was not immune. Are you allergic, Will asked. Allergic to what? You always pick them out of your food, he said, looking at her plate and forking the harvest, harvested slice of pepper. 
This close reading of her behavior was almost too much for Stephanie to comprehend. No one had ever bothered to track her movements and turn them into a story. Then back on her bed, all the heartache arrived. She wished she could make her room large enough to escape herself. Pathetic. There must be a horizon at the edge of this feeling, Stephanie thought, but it was still out of view. She switched on her purple lamp and curled under the old quilt, the sound of happiness attacking from a distant quad. Oh, she could go everywhere in her life and still never make it to the end of will. The classrooms, the library, the cafeteria, the dorm, the sharp hexagon of her daily routine expanding in his presence, more prismatic, digressive, a creased and tented map. On the other side of the room, on the other side of his jokes, in his university branded hat, in his circumference of recognition, at the terrible recital, under the famous courtyard statue, once again in the crawl space tunnel, and across from him on the couch in their suite. College was a series of meeting spots arranged across time in proximity to trees. She waited for him to arrive by accident at the place she had picked on purpose. So I'll stop there and um, I'm gonna read a little something else. Oh, thank you. That's nice. Everyone in Philly is so nice, except, except when the Phillies lose. <laughs> then you're not nice at all. Um, but who can blame you, honestly? So I'm gonna read one more thing and um, you can't tell it all from the passage I just read, but the main plot of this book is about space and limited space and tiny apartments and closets leading out onto terraces that shouldn't be there, the space between people, intimacy, the distance between ideas and wrong and right. And so I thought, for when I was planning events for, for this book, I thought it would be really cool to be able to make the book larger than the one you hold in your hands, much in the way some of the spaces in the book are larger than they appear to be. And so I wrote a really short story composed of deleted lines from my novel, and I collaged them all together. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to recite that for you now. Okay, you don't have a choice, so <laughs> I'm glad it's okay with you. Um, this is called Alcove, which was a section of the book that I cut. One, if you press a certain spot, an opening appears. No witnesses the way the earth always changes. A dare someone made, a sheet of perforated paper, several shell corporations, the lake filled with glacier water, a local zoning loophole. The office was not even an office. No one under 30 ate breakfast anymore. Kites could go higher, giant crusts of earth. This was the common theory. It was better to hurt yourself than to hurt someone else. It might have been nonsense. It reminds students of a popular movie franchise. Look to your left, look to your right, little vermilion spots. Two. They are both distressed for different reasons. She had been published without compensation. There were no buildings named after her. He would make everything worse. No one waiting for him to turn on the sprinklers. In school, had he ever worn a coat? She stood outside his door and waited, but the door was open. Lunch in a single illuminated square. He stuffed a large leaf into his mouth and it folded over the edge of his lip. She would stay, they would eat. Three, they became historians of the same details. Quick, take a picture, she said. They made minor quiet deals with the world. They wrote bad essays the night before they were due and some poor schmuck like you had to grade them. What happened after that? Would it be painful? Who taught you how to do it like that? A birthday party on the ground? A retirement party? Wasn't that what happened to everyone eventually? 
Were snails sluggish or was that slugs? <laughs> it was not adequately researched. The office finally denied the forms. Four, by the staircase, her exhaustion, he picked up one place at a time. We need to get you some migraine pills, he said. She thought he wanted to talk about love. He expected that the problem was resolved. That terrible fight. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Somewhere in their time apart, she drove through his town without stopping. The wet spring city, the original crater in the attic of the family estate, her alma mater after dark. She played dead as a preamble to dying. It made her feel better, though she wasn't sure exactly why. Something tugging at her chest. Would she be left alone? Five. Flash forward thousands of years. The jump might kill her. Her friend promised to post the picture. The winter had been awkward. A nearby bench melts into late March. For a month or two, on blankets, in crop tops, 20 years on, 10 years before, 50 years hence, practically overnight. She forgot about that whole day. She made a note in the margin, a true souvenir, a ritual from far enough away. They go out for drinks that night. He sets the sprinklers on a timer. She wants to know where to put her hands. After all these years, it will maybe take just a little longer. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, this is my hometown. So I'm going to read a chapter from Death Valley. Um, and in this chapter, uh, all you need to know is that the protagonist has just gone inside a giant cactus that is not supposed to grow in California. Um, and she is in California. She doesn't know that it's not supposed to grow in California. Um, it's a saguaro. Nine. Chap it's chapter nine. <laughs> the cactus is hollow inside. Oh, also, her father is maybe, probably dying in the hospital. The cactus is hollow inside, a narrow chamber with a vaulted ceiling. Sun shines through the slit, illuminating the walls, the moist green flesh, and latticed wooden skeleton. I keep checking the slit, touching it to make sure I have a way out. I hope I'm not further injuring the cactus by being inside. The ground is sand and rock, same as on the outside with a ring of roots burrowing into the earth. I sit down on the army jacket, she has her dad's army jacket, and recline against a big rock. Looking up is like looking up inside the nave of a cathedral. What I see in that arching darkness makes me feel compelled to pray. Instead of words, the prayer that comes out of me is a hum. I recognize the tune from somewhere. I know I didn't make it up. I keep humming until it comes to me. Shaboom by the chords, a favorite of my father's. I had to buy the rights to Shaboom. And if they had been any more expensive, I would not have been able to, and I would have had to change this to Shadu. Um, <laughs> But I, I was able to buy them, which is good because Shaboom is like an incantation throughout the book. I close my eyes and get into it, really ham it up. Life could be a dream. It's been days since I've pre prayed or meditated. If I could take you up in paradise up above. Unless you count the Reddit prayer or the botched Circle K toilet attempt or the botched Best Western parking lot Hail Mary. She's been saying a lot of prayers to get, try to get rid of anxiety, which aren't working. If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love, I don't count those prayers. Life could be a dream, sweetheart. Hello, hello again. Shaboom and hope and we'll meet again. Hey, Nani, ding dong. Don't be a spiritual materialist. A lang, a lang, a lang. Is this song about death? My hymn is interrupted by a scratching sound on my left. I hadn't thought about any wild animals getting in the cactus. I'd rather not be eaten as it goes against my wish for a quick and painless death. When I open my eyes, the scratching stops. 
I look around. There's nothing except me and the cactus walls. I close my eyes again and get back to my shabooming. The scratching comes back, not so much a scratching as a digging. I open my eyes and sit all the way up. There, seated next to me, playing in the sand, is a small child. The child is a brunette with a full head of curls, a scrawny looking thing. He wears a white t-shirt, khaki pants with big cuffs and penny loafers. How did he get in here? Hello, I say. But the child doesn't look up. He's absorbed in his playing. He has a red bucket and beside it is a pile of stones. He is methodical, digging in the ground, sifting sand into the bucket and then adding any stones he finds to the pile. Dig, sift, pile. The child has small eyes, high cheekbones, and a few freckles across the bridge of his little nose. I notice that he uses his left hand for most of the action. Then I recognize the child. The child is my father. Love floods into me. Oxytocin, dopamine, sticky souls, the cleave of spirits, noroepinephrine, bone and light, a covenant behind the ribs. Whatever love is made of, I love this child. It's a love tinged with loss or the anticipation of loss, the way I love my father, the grown-up, to miss a person when the person is right beside you. I want to hug the child, to feel the warmth of his scrawny body, but I'm afraid of scaring him off, so I sit very still and watch. He turns over his bucket, one of those buckets etched with turrets and lookout holes that's used for making a sandcastle. I realize that I've seen this scene before, in an album at my parents' house, a black and white photo of my father as a little boy playing in the sand, same bucket. On the back of the photo in my grandmother's handwriting, Venice Beach, 1954. My father is five. In the photo, he wears oversized swim shorts, no shoes or shirt. So where did these clothes come from? Another photo in the same album, same summer, my father feeding seagulls on the Venice boardwalk, laughing wildly. In that photo, he wears the white t-shirt, the khaki pants, the penny loafers. My father, the child, lifts up his blanket. He reveals, oh, sorry, his bucket. He reveals beneath it the perfect cylindric tower of a sandcastle. Very nice, I say. This time he turns to look at me. He gives me a little wave. He has a shy look on his face, but not quite a smile. And the wave is friendly. Then he turns back to his castle. Do you mind if I just sit here, I ask? Extending the same question I always ask my father on hospital business, visits, even when he's unconscious and cannot answer. I can't help but seek approval, even when the approval can't be given. My father, the child, shakes his curly head, no, he doesn't mind. You don't have to entertain me, I say, just in case he feels obligated to shake his head, no, when he really means, yes, I do mind. My father, the child, goes right on playing, dotting the turrets of his castle with stones, a hint of a smile on his face, so content to be left alone. And I see it now. He has always been a self-contained universe. To wish it otherwise is to ask him to be a different person. Not really a fair thing to ask. Can you be other than you are? But I can close my eyes, opening them once in a while to make sure he is still there, until I stop opening them at all and just listen. Him digging and sifting, me breathing and shabooming, each of us doing our thing, side by side, in parallel play, although I am not playing. Thank you. And if no one asks any, we were going to play Coke, at, Hi, Coke and Pepsi like they did at my cousin Eli's bar mitzvah on Saturday. <laughs> Thank you Hi, both. Hi, Hillary. Hi. Excellent readings. Thank you both so Thanks. much. Congratulations on these books. Well, I would, would you both please talk a little bit about the inspiration for this book? I'll go for sure. it. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So um, in December of 2020, my dad, um, who doesn't live in California or Venice Beach, uh, was in a car accident in Philadelphia and um, was in the ICU for six months. And it was during COVID, so we weren't allowed in to see him for a couple of months. And um, during that time, um, I was in a state of anticipatory grief, but I didn't know what that was at a time. I just thought my usual levels of anxiety and depression had like spawned new anxiety and depression babies. Um, and we're like mutating into like a new species. Um, and I was trying to escape a feeling, uh, the feeling, um, but unfortunately you can't escape a feeling because it's inside you. Um, and um, I was driving back and forth from my house in Los Angeles to my sister's in Las Vegas through the desert, driving through the town of Baker, California, um, when, um, which is the home of the world's largest thermometer, when um, <laughs> the first line of the novel came to me. and. Um, 
I, this idea came to me of a giant cactus where you could go inside and encounter uh, different iterations of your loved ones um, at various stages of their lives and sort of get more time with them. Um, but I then took a desert recon trip a few months later um, and uh, went to this area called Zabriskie Point, very touristy area. I went alone, um, went by myself, did not bring water, um, brought Coke Zero. Um, I'm not very outdoorsy. It's this very, um, it's a touristy area. No one gets lost there. I got very lost. And um, when I got back to my car after, I was like, how long have I been out here? I'm going to die. It had been like 45 minutes. But, um, and I climbed up this rock face trying to get back and got pretty scratched up. Um, and when I got back to, and my phone had no service. And when I got back to my car, after I'd stopped crying, um, I was very happy because I realized, well, now I know what's going to happen in my novel. The protagonist is going to get lost in the desert, and she's going to get lost for more than 45 minutes. So. I love, so the next time I have writer's block, I should just go to the desert and not charge my phone. Mm -hmm. This is a great plan. Um, so I, I wrote the first chapter of Tara's story as a standalone short story when I was living in a very tiny apartment with my husband, I was like 400 square feet. We had to climb over each other to get anywhere. Um, and the book is about a very small apartment with a closet that magically turns into a terrace. So I was dreaming of outdoor space and I thought it was done. And then the story was published in spring of 2020. I don't know if you all remember what was going on then, <laughs> but I realized that it was now about something completely different. We were kind of, in the throes of that immediate lockdown, and at least in New York, you couldn't really go anywhere. There was, there was nowhere to go, and so that claustrophobia had become global. Um, I was thinking a lot about how my initial feelings had transformed to, you know, the world had caught up with something that I had written, and that was curious to me. I was thinking a lot about the collective grief we were all experiencing, and my own grief, and, um, and then the rest of the book just kind of came out of me. But thinking about how a story or a book can predict something that hasn't happened yet, it became really clear that the book had to move through time in a different kind of way. Um, and so, so I always hesitate when someone asks where the book came from because there's so much in there that, that happened later after I wrote it, even now having finished it as a novel and not just as a short story. Um, and I think that if you're writing toward something that you're feeling really deeply, a book can predict things that haven't occurred. And that's, that's how I like to think of it. Hi. Um, so this is a question for Melissa. I love your book so much. And I love the, like, mythological element that kind of pervades them. And I just was wondering, like, is that something that kind of comes naturally to you as like a worldview and like how you see things? Or is it kind of more um, like metaphors that you have to construct consciously, like as you're writing? So, yeah. Sure. So um, definitely organic. You know, I have a poetry. I You don't know, but I have a poetry background <laughs> um, and, um, you know, poets love a metaphor. Um, but I think that. Um, you know, we all have such different life experiences, right? Like, every, no human life is the same, but the commonality we have is um, on the emotional level, right? Like, there's only a certain number of emotions, and, and that's, like, really, to me, the language of the heart, right? Um, and so how do I, as a novelist, like, render those emotions tangible? What well, one way is an, an imagistic, and one way is through archetype and through myth. Um, and they've... The, for my novel, The Pisces, um, where there's a merman, and for this novel, where there's the giant cactus, and also the desert, I think, acts as a metaphor. There's talking rabbits. There, you know, there's a lot of archetypal s stuff going on. I don't think talking rabbits are Jungian, but you know, there's a lot of archetypal <laughs> stuff going on. Um, they, uh, there's rocks that speak. Um, it really, it, it came to me, they both came to me very organically, and they were both very influenced by where I was at the time. Pisces, I was on Venice Beach reading about a mermaid. Uh, bo a book about a mermaid, and um, and Death Valley, I was, you know, driving through Baker. Um, but it's funny, because it's like, try explaining to someone your idea 
um, you know, like I'll tell an artist friend, like, yeah, and there's a giant cactus, and, and they're like, okay. Like, I'm never sure if I'm gonna be able to pull it off. Um, and then with Milk Fed, there is a mythical golem, and there's also this rabbi who um, the protagonist sees and no one can see. And with, the, with that book, with the, with the golem and the rabbi, they actually didn't enter the picture until like my last drafts of the book, and I had to weave them in. Um, and I used them to really deepen the um, theme of how clearly do we ever see anyone that we're in love with? And isn't everyone we're in love with in some way like a golem of our own making, right? So th that, those came, I think, I mean, they came organically in the sense that um, I thought of them when I was like meditating at like a, um, like a, a Crown Plaza in New York on my book tour for the Pisces. You know, I thought of, I, for, uh, I thought of those characters, but, but, they, but they didn't come in until much later and they ended up being my favorite characters, probably because I spent the least time with them. You know, I mean, I spent a lot of time with them, but like the other characters, I was, I was like, I need the, you all to go away by the end, you know? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you both so much. Um, I feel like your writing, the both of your writing is so distinct that someone could just give me a page from your book and I'd know it was you without knowing it was you. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about voice, um, your relationship to voice, and maybe when it first came to you. That's such a beautiful question. Um, and it's another one where the answer is, I don't know, and I think I think a lot of voice comes from imitating other voices until you find your own. And so, a lot of my early stories that I was writing were just ripoffs, you know. And I was just writing them for myself. And I was trying to, I would read a book and think, how did they do that? And then I would try and do it. And the magical thing is that even if you're ripping off another writer, you can never sound like anyone but yourself. <laughs> so I would. I would try and do a Ray Bradbury, or I would try and do a Laurie Moore, and I just sounded like Hillary all the time, um, whether I liked it or not. And I think I think something that's been useful for me is not not fighting that. You know, I think something that's so painful when you're a writer is feeling like you want to be one voice, but you only have your voice, and kind of embracing what you have, embracing who you are as a writer, and leaning into it all the way until it's fully weirdly your own and not fighting it. And so, so and I, I feel that way about your work, Melissa. I think that, um, I think you can feel like, you can feel a voice fighting itself and in Death Valley and all of your books, you can feel an author embracing their voice. And I feel that with your writing and, mm -hmm. and just fully embodying it too. But I, but yeah, I don't know, I can't, I mean, like, I can't help making a pun in real life. I can't help making a pun on the page. It's just, <laughs> it's my curse. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. You know, I do think I can, I, I do get influenced by what I'm reading. Um, there's, a, there's a scene in Death Valley where, um, where specifically it is the moment she sort of comes to the reckoning that she is completely lost in the desert. And I happen to be reading Thomas Bernhard's um, uh, I think it was correction at the time. And um, like, I feel like just this one chapter, like it's like if anyone loves Do Thomas Bernhard, he's very distinct, his sentences go on for like pages. You would know that I was reading Thomas Bernhard at the time because Thomas Bernhard is this writer that like, uh, you can't help but be, like he gets in there, you know? And so as she's traveling and the sentences get very long, but it really works because she's getting lost in the desert, right? And, um, and sort of getting woozy. Um, but I think that voice for me, um, it's, I try, you know, when I write, I try to write the, the book that I want to read. And I think that, um, so voice can be in that sense, right? Like I love books. Like if a book has um, sex, humor, and magic, like I'm in. If it has two of the three, I'm probably in, right? And so, <laughs> Um, and with this book has like no sex, um, which is a, a first for me, um, but but it has death. Um, but so um, same same right? Like, yeah, I mean you know it's yeah. yeah there are two sides of one yeah. of one coin really. Um, but so um, I think you know with the voice of this with the voice of uh, when I'm but when I am writing sex right like. I, I'm like, okay, I have to turn myself on. And if I turn myself on, then maybe I can turn on some others, right? And 
Um, and same with um, humor, you know, which is very important to me. Um, I have a friend, this writer, Susan Cheever, who um, we were reading um, Vanity Fair together, um, the Make Peace Thackeray book, and she's like, you can just tell he's having a good time. And I feel like you, when you're reading a book, like, even if it's a very sad book, you can tell if the writer is having a good time. And I feel like if the writer's having a good time, in spite of all the struggle and Michigas and marathon quality of writing a novel, the reader's gonna have a better chance of having a good time. And that's, I think, where my voice comes from. Hillary, the second part of your presentation, which you did not read from a printed page, I'm wondering, how did it come about that you end up having that so well seated in your soul and in your mind? And is it, is it for you by so being what it has become, is it something you might compare to a favorite prayer? Is it something that you find yourself falling into embracing at times you wouldn't have expected? I mean, there's something very special about knowing something that length by heart that's not from previously known sources. Uh, talk a little yeah. bit about that because it, it just interests, it's, it's fascinating. And lovely. Well, I'm a little bit of a freak. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I guess I'm I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> um, no, that's a lovely question, and I never thought of it as being like a prayer. But yeah, of course, I think I think something uh, extraordinary happens when when we memorize things and not not things that we've written anything and i can feel it happening in everyday life um you know in conversation with people who are meaningful to me and the fascinating thing about what we remember is that it usually doesn't coincide with what other people remember and i find that incredibly heartbreaking but also so powerful if we all remembered the same things, then half or more of the world would disappear. So I think about memorization a lot, and I think about it also in terms of reading books more than once, and what we remember when we finish a book. And the truth is, for me, not much. And I don't know about all of you, but when I finish reading something, ask me a year later, or even like two months later, <laughs> what, it, what happened on a sentence level or what happened chapter to chapter or what the main character's name was. And I read a lot, but a lot of it just fades away and all that's left is the emotion that I was left with at the end of the book. When you reread a book, it's like rediscovering parts of your brain because you've seen all of those sentences before, but they've been stored somewhere that's not accessible. And so I, I think about the problem of memory a lot, actually. Um, the short answer to your question is that when I was at Haverford, I was a theater kid, and so I can't resist putting on a show. That's kind of my, <laughs> that's kind of my thing. And so, you know, I, memorizing words and memorizing other writers' words to perform them was something that was so important to me, and I took it very seriously. You know, there was no room to improvise. If, if someone has written something and given it to you to present to people, I feel like that's a huge responsibility, and I guess I wanted to do the same thing for my work, too, you know? It's like an act of believing in yourself when you don't necessarily all the time, preempting that disbelief. Um, thank you both so much for your readings. They were incredible. Um, Hillary, I also have a question for you. you. You've talked about Tara's story being about space and grief and loss. And one of the other things that really stuck with me after reading the book was how much it was also about desire, like desire for space in some cases, but also sexual desire and desire for closeness. And I was just wondering, if you could talk a little bit about how you thought about it, because you 
you explored desire in so many different ways, which felt um, especially powerful because you're talking primarily about women's desire in the book. Yeah. Um, I think that the problem of space actually is a problem of desire. It's not a physical problem, it's an emotional problem. And the fact that you can never be anyone but yourself, and the fact that when you love someone, there is, it's, it's an asymptote trying to get close to that person. You can never fully reach them. Um, yeah, space seems to be about the desire for connection, to me at least, and so, um, the characters in the book are, yes, some of them are longing for bigger apartments, some of them are longing for love, some of them are longing um, to be reunited with, with their children or family members, and um, it, it felt like if I wanted to make the book do what the plot was doing, it had to, it had to create that kind of longing in the reader. And so part of the challenge was to take characters away that maybe you've grown attached to and not explain why, and to create large omissions between the sections of the book so you're having to catch up to what has happened to the people that you were just with in the same way that you would have to catch up to someone that you've lost um, who you reconnect with. And I wanted to mimic that, that feeling of desire for closeness that is so thematic in the book in, in the reader. I wanted the reader to feel that personally. And also in your book too, there's that fear of the disappearance of the loved one, right? And there yeah. is the disappearance of the loved one and vanished, well, I don't want to yeah. spoil it. And that. in your book as well yeah. too. I mean, it's our, both of our books have these portals. Mm -hmm. I mean, Melissa has a cactus you and have I a have terrace. a terrace, but. Um, and space travel. And space travel, <laughs> but they're both, they're both you know, these, these kind of magic wardrobes where you can access something that is currently being taken away from you or is, you know, the loss is imminent or the loss has already happened. And I think, I, like, what a human desire to want that, that space outside of time where you can find what's been um, misplaced. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a question from Melissa. I remember reading a while back about uh, your process being to be driving and re recording voice notes and then editing. And I'm wondering um, if that changed at all uh, with the pandemic um, or if you continue doing that and if you could talk a little bit more about sort of how you do that and how that works and what you find from that. Sure. So um, in 2013, I moved from New York to Los Angeles. And um, I in New York, I used to write my poems on the subway when... I, once I moved to LA, um, I was driving, and you can't do that. Um, and so uh, it was not recommended on the 405 highway. So um, I began um, I began dictating, and I would use um, a simple a note called sim an app called Simple Note, which I still use a lot. And um, it would through Siri. Um, I would do all of my first drafts that way. Uh, well, what happened was the line breaks disappeared from my poems, and um, the, um, oh, hi, Pat. Uh, the line breaks disappeared from my poems, and um, it became conversational, and that's how my first book of essays, So Sad Today, was born. It was literally like, an organ like a very natural, almost like topographical shift. Um, after that, I had this idea to write the Pisces, my first novel, and I was like, I don't know if I can write a novel. Um, as a poet, why would I say in, you know, 300 pages what I could say in three pages? But I decided to just experiment and dictate. And I did that, um, and it worked, um, and I did that for the Pisces, and I did that for Milk Fed. Death Valley, I started to dictate, and then I stopped, and I did it all. I did it very differently. Um, and I think I did it differently this time um, because in a way, like, you know, writing a novel is always a risk. I have a novel that I worked on for, for years that's in a drawer, never to see the light of day. Um, you know, it's always a risk and, you know, you're, you're alone in a room or in a car for a very long time and you wonder if you're Jack Nicholson in The Shining just writing the same word over and over because you very well could be. And, um, but with this book, I took a risk and I really edited it as I went along, like poetry. So I edited it on a sentence level and really wanted each chapter to be a diamond as I went, rather than sort of like dictating, getting the clay, and then sculpting, sculpting, sculpting after. And the reason why it's a risk to edit 
so early on and to try to make it perfect so early on is that a lot can change and a lot can be removed. So it's like these perfect sentences may have to go. But I think the reason uh, ultimately was because I started it two months before my dad died and um, I really saw it as this, I don't know if I'd call it a gift for him because I don't know that my dad necessarily would want to have a, you know, but, um, but it was, it was something between us, you know, that he did not know about, but it was something between us and it gave me some sort of forward propulsion with my father, even though he was no longer alive. Um, and so because it was something between us and in a way a gift or an offering, um, I wanted it to be perfect, even if it never saw publication, right? Like even if it didn't work, um, which who knows if a giant cactus will work. It does. <laughs> okay. First of all, I just want to say thank you both. It's such a delight to be able to be here this evening and just to bathe in your words, so thank you so much for that. I'm curious um, about, as your work has gone into circulation, um, as your work has ended up in the hands of very different readers, as you hear from readers their responses, as you, I don't know if you read reviews, if that's painful or exciting or, or what that looks like. I'm just curious about um, what, um, what might have emerged um, as you've um, engaged with readers that might be because uh, again, I'm imagining the moment at which kind of like, right, there will be students writing their papers the night before, kind of like misreading or, you know, beautifully <laughs> reading kind of like the work that you're putting forward. I'm curious about whether um, um, seeing your work through other people's eyes has opened up something un unexpected or surprising in terms of the work. That is, if, if anything, if there has been a moment of, uh, huh, okay, didn't see that myself, but understand how that comes. So I'm just curious about, um, yeah, what it might have um, opened up or resonated as you've as your work has, yeah, um, um, inspired interpretations or readings on different registers, or yeah, when you see your work next to James Patterson's at the <laughs> at the at the airport, which is such a delight, you know, kind of like to see that. But I'm just curious about what what does that encounter look like, um, yeah, with other readers, or when you see your work in other places. Do you read your reviews? Like, yeah, I do. I don't. I, I yeah. Do you? I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Do you want me to start? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Go for it. You're, you're on a roll. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so when my work manages to infiltrate in academia and someone tells me they've written a thesis about it, I'm like, please send it to me. And they always come up with things that I had no idea were in the work. But I'm like, yes, that could work. Um, the other day, someone tweeted me a photo of a bearded merman and said, this is Theo from the Pisces. When I, the merman, when I wrote the Pisces, I always imagined Theo clean shaven, but I realized that she's absolutely right because where would he get a razor under the sea? Um, what else other surprises? There was a Goodreads review of, so the, the narrator in Death Valley is unnamed. There was a Goodreads review of the book. I only read my five star Goodreads reviews though. I don't, um, there was a... You're so healthy. Yeah. It was years of Amazon, checking Amazon rankings, oh and then I, I was like, there's nothing here for me. No, um, you're right, you're right. Yeah. No, you're right. We, tra we, tra we train ourselves. Yeah. But um, so there was this review of Death Valley. The, the protagonist is unnamed, and they said, this is a book about a woman named Esther. And, and I was like, is her name Esther? I don't think I gave her, so I don't know where that came from. But, um, oh, my God. Yeah, so it's actually a delight. I guess the last mo most enjoyable thing is there's a character in this book who, um, the best Western is like a very, uh, it, it's a character in the book, the best Western. And um, there's a woman, Jethra, who works at the best Western. And someone told me that they're going to be writing Jethra fanfic. So I'm really excited. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God, you've broken through to the fanfic universe. That's I mean, like, oh. Jethra has. Jethra has. Yeah, and, and your narrator is now Esther forevermore. I'll never think of her another way. Um, I, yeah, I love reading reviews, and I love when a review, I love when a review finds something that I didn't know about, but I also love when a review is psychic and completely understands what I was trying to do, and I was so lucky to have a couple of reviews like that for Tara's story, and it's such a relief, too, especially, you know, Melissa and I write kind of offbeat shit, you know, like it's not, it's not, um, it's not run of the mill, and, and to, to be understood I think is is a feeling that I will never get over as a writer, and it's the thing that no one told me about before I was a published writer, and what a thrill to know that the characters exist in other people's heads, and um, I don't know, I'll never get over that. It's still just a Word document on my computer that no one's supposed to know about. 
uh, th things that people have said that I hadn't thought of. This one is maybe surprising. Maybe I should have thought of it, but, but many people have come up to me at events and said that they have recurring dreams of finding an extra room in their homes or in their apartments. And enough people said this to me that I had to look up what it meant. And so if you're having that dream right now, <laughs> it, <laughs> it means that you're, you're growing in some unexpected way or you're accessing a new part of yourself. Maybe, I don't know, this is, what, <laughs> this is what the internet says, so take it with a grain of salt. But I thought that was cool, that that was something that, that people were experiencing in their subconscious that, that I made fiction, and I've never had that dream. Um, what else, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say that I'm also okay with, with gross misinterpretations of the book too, because I think that I think it's so important to leave space for whatever a reader finds there. And I really believe in releasing control of the thing that I've made um, into the world. And it, it's yours now. It doesn't belong to me anymore. Um, I'm staying with a friend from high school and in Philly this, this week. And last night, we were talking about the book. and. Um, all of the houses and locations in the book are places from our town growing up. Be not, not literally, but for her reading it because I'm the one who wrote it. And those weren't the places I was thinking of. Those aren't the places that exist in my mind, but they are the places in her mind. And I think that's, that disconnect makes the world of the book larger. I think that is the perfect place to end our evening. Thank you both so much Thank for joining you. us. Thanks for Thank having you. us. <laughs>